welcome to your daily writing habit. I'm your host, Christine Whitmarsh. If you're searching for me online, you can look up Christine Inc., I-N-K, like the stuff you write with. Each day, I'm sharing with you the writing fundamentals, productivity, and mindset habits I've picked up over my 18 years as a ghostwriter, book coach, and author. And I am so excited about my guest today here on your daily writing habit. He is best-selling author and so much more, Nir Ayal. And here is a little bit about Nir and his impressive career. Nir writes, consults, and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. The MIT Technology Review dubbed Nir the prophet of habit-forming technology. He is the author of the best-selling book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. In addition to blogging at nearandfar.com, that's N-I-R and F-A-R.com, Near's writing has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, TechCrunch, and Psychology Today. Near attended the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Emory University. And thank you so much for being here today, Near. Well, my pleasure, Christine. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Especially, yeah, I know you have your upcoming launch on September 10th. That's easy to remember. It's my sister's birthday of your new book. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes, I've been, I've been busy, but of course, had to make time. It's so great. Thank you for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Good. So let's start with the aforementioned new book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, a book that promises to, and this is from your website, reveal the hidden psychology driving us to distraction. And I love both of those topics, <laughs> psychology and distraction and slash attention. So I would love to hear from you the story of how this book came about, why you knew you had to write it, and what you hope people will gain by reading it. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the seminal moment when I realized I had to write this book uh, was when I was sitting with my daughter and we had this afternoon together where we could just, you know, play and we had this book of activities that daddies and daughters could do together. And the, 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 the page I remember uh, this particular incident occurring was a question. It was a prompt uh, that I remember verbatim. The, the prompt was, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I wish I could tell you what my daughter's answer was, but I can't because in that moment, something pinged or dinged on my phone and I was on my device as opposed to being fully present with someone I love very much. And the next thing I realized when I looked up from my phone, she was gone. She'd gotten the message that uh, whatever was on my phone was more important than she was and she left. She started playing outside. And that's when I realized, wow, I had, I had to do something about this. And if I told you that this only happened once, I'd be lying. And if I told you it only happened uh, in this one area, that would also be untrue because I noticed that my, my writing practice suffered for it. I, I couldn't concentrate on, on my work as well as, as I thought I should. Uh, I wasn't taking care of my body, right? I wasn't going to the gym. I wasn't eating healthily. I was constantly getting distracted by not doing what I knew I wanted to do. And so that's why, I, you know, reflecting upon this, I thought, you know what? If there was a superpower I'd actually want, I'd want the power to be indistractable. I want the power to always do whatever it was I said I'm going to do, no matter what that is, right? If I say I'm going to write, I want to write. If I say I'm going to go to the gym, I want to go to the gym. If I say I want to be with my daughter, I want to be fully present with my daughter. That would be a superpower. And so that's where I started diving into the deeper psychology behind why do we get distracted exactly? I mean, if we know what to do, there's no knowledge gap here. We basically know what to do, right? If you, if you want to be a writer, write, sit down, write. Why don't we do it? Why do we constantly not do what we know we should do? And so that's, that was the genesis of, of this five-year journey to, to write Indistractable. I love every part of that, <laughs> you know, from our brief conversation before. That is awesome. And what are you kind of hoping is in terms of a reader promise that people will get, what the biggest thing they'll get from this book? Yeah, so I, what I got from it, I, you know, I have to admit that I write books for me. <laughs> I, I've, yeah. I've had dozens and dozens of book ideas that I never write because uh, the first step of researching, oh, you know what, I, I, I have a problem in my life I'm trying to solve is doing some research. And so I'll read a book on, I'll read as many books as I can on the topic. And if I find a book that addresses the problem that I'm facing uh, and the solution works, then I'm done. I don't need to write a book that's already been written, right? I'll recommend somebody else's book. But when it came to this specific problem, I couldn't find any book that actually worked because every book out there basically tells you the same thing, that technology is the problem. Technology is hijacking your brain. Technology is 
is addicting you. And it's not true for the vast majority of people. Now, some people do have a pathology, right? Some people are actually addicted. They have obsessive compulsive disorder, some kind of, uh, of, of actual pathology. It's single digit percentages of the population. But for the vast majority of people out there, there's nothing wrong with you. And so we need to come to grips with the fact that these things aren't doing it to us. It's that we just don't have the tools, the understanding for how to get the best of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. So Indistractable is a pro-human, pro-tech approach to using these technologies because, you know, a lot of academics can, can sit in their ivory towers and say, don't use social media. Uh, that's the problem. And they, you know, they don't have social media accounts, but I need social media. Like I, I, my livelihood depends on it. That's where my readers are. I need to connect with them. I can't just stop using email, stop using social media. This is, this is what my, my livelihood depends on. So I don't want to tell people to stop using these tools because they, one, it's, we, we need them for our livelihoods, many of us as authors, but two, you know, doing so, going on some 30-day detox or some digital diet, diet plan, they don't, it doesn't work for the same reasons that fad diets don't work. So I, I used to be clinically obese at one point in my life, and I would do these fad diets, you know, no fast food for 30 days. And you know what happened on day 31, right? I, I would eat everything I could possibly get my hands on <laughs> because the diet was over. And so, of course, we do the same thing. And I tried these, these programs in these books. I did the digital detox as a 30-day plan. They don't work because they don't teach us how to deal with the underlying psychology of why we get distracted in the first place. Totally agree. I actually wrote about that recently, or I did some, it sounds familiar. I talked about that, about the, you know, kind of went off against the social media detoxes. So same page, mm. once again, with you near. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the validation. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think are the greatest misconceptions people have about distraction and how it affects productivity? So I think the biggest myth is that distraction comes from things outside of us. That I think it's important, first and foremost, we need to understand what distraction is. How do we define distraction? So to define distraction, it's, it's, it's helpful to understand what distraction is not. What is the opposite of distraction? The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. They both come, both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull, and both words end in the same five letter word, action, A-C-T-I-O-N. So traction and distraction are both actions that we take, not things that happen to us, but actions that we take. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you're doing with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, any action that you take that pulls you away from what you want to do. So this is important in a few ways. One, it frees us from this, from this moral hierarchy that what some people want to do with their time is somehow okay, but what other people do with their time is not okay. Uh, you playing Candy Crush, that's bad. Me watching football, that's okay. No, it's ridiculous. Whatever it is you want to do with your time is fine as long as you do it with intent. Second, it also dismisses this, this myth that some things are somehow you know, beneficial to us because they feel productive even when they're not. So for example, my, my confession here is that I would sit down at my desk. And you know, when, I, when I first started writing professionally, it was very easy for me because uh, nobody was emailing me, <laughs> right? Nobody needed me throughout the day. So I could just sit and write and there were no, uh, no nothing would take, took me off track. But then as I got you know, some, some bit of success, I started getting some more emails and inquiries. And so I would sit down at my desk to write and I would think to myself, oh, you know what? I, I should probably just check email for a quick sec. Or let me just Google that, that, that thing I've been thinking about. Just do a bit of research, right? I would convince myself that that was necessary. And you see, distraction tricks us. It makes us think that we need to do something. Right now, that's kind of productive, right? But it's not. It's pseudo work. And it's just as much of a pernicious distraction. You know, email or Googling something or research is just as much of a distraction as playing a video game if it's not what you plan to do. If, if I plan to write, that's traction. Anything else is distraction. So we have traction and distraction on, on either side. Now, what moves us towards traction or distraction is only two things, external triggers or internal triggers. 
External triggers are all the pings, dings, rings in our environment that prompt us to either traction or distraction. They're not inherently good or bad. It depends on what we do in response to those external triggers. So if you have an alarm on your phone that says, hey, it's time to write, well, now that's great. It moves you towards traction. But if you're writing and you get a notification on your phone from Facebook or Instagram, whatever, now it's moving you towards distraction. But external triggers are where most people think distraction starts, but it actually turns out to be much less of a problem than the number one source of distraction, which are these internal triggers. Internal triggers are uncomfortable psychological states that we seek to escape from. It's boredom, anxiety, uncertainty, fatigue. This is what prompts us to traction or distraction much more often than anything in our, in our outside environment. So the biggest myth, I think what people don't realize when it comes to distraction, is that most distraction starts from within. Love that. Totally agree. And I, I love the breakdown of the word. Totally word geeking out on that as a writer now. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it, right? I knew that you, you and your audience would love it. Because I, I love that kind of stuff as well. <laughs> all, my, all my ink authors right now, we're all geeking out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So now uh, I want to, this is my way of transitioning to your other awesome best-selling book. And it's kind of a moment of cosmic coincidence because a few nights ago, I've been reading uh, Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. And mm. I came across a familiar name that, that one of the Titans <laughs> was recommending his book. And I said, why does that name sound familiar? Oh, I'm interviewing him this week. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it was uh, FBI futurist Mark Goodman. He singled out your book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products for Having a Significant Impact on His Life. So first of all, you know, tell me about the book, of course, but how does it feel to be singled out as a, as a tool of Titans? <laughs> Well, I, thank you. I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't hear about that until like a year after the book was published. Nobody told me that I was mentioned in the book, and I didn't happen to read it. But it was it's, uh, obviously, you know, very flattered by it. Uh, but it's, it's great. So the, the first book uh, was really about how to use technology to build healthy habits in users' life. Uh, and the book is now five years. We're just approaching our the five year anniversary of the book. It's, it's, you know, I self published it at first, and I had very little expectations, and then it got picked up by Portfolio and. Uh, we passed a few months ago 250,000 copies, so I'm I'm just as thrilled and, and and surprised as anyone about the about the success of the book. And I think the reason it's resonated is that it it kind of you know reveals uh, two things. One, how products can be used for good, how we can use technology to help people build healthy habits, to save money, to exercise more, to create habits around you know, enjoying and engaging in education. So thousands of companies have reached out to me since the book was published to tell me how they're using these, pro these techniques for good. It's not just about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram using these techniques. I, I wanted to democratize these techniques so that anyone can use them to build products to help people live healthier, happier, more productive lives. The second reason I wrote Hooked is that, you know, I wanted people to see the insides of the psychology of how these products change our behaviors not that we become addicted and we're somehow mind controlled by these products, but that rather if we understand how the psychology works, we can do something about it. We can put it in its place. And so indistractable kind of felt like this natural extension of really breaking down, you know, the, in Hook, it was really for makers. It was for people who are building products, but indistractable is specifically written for a wider audience of people, uh, anyone who struggles with distraction. Great. And that was what I was going to ask you next is the connection between the two, especially in light of that LinkedIn post that I commented on yesterday where someone tweeted about you, guy who literally wrote the book on using behavioral <laughs> psychology and tech to manipulate people now selling how not to be manipulated, which to yeah, me made perfect yeah. sense. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Talk about like a case study in judging a book by the cover. The book isn't even out yet. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way you read it. <laughs> but, but, you know, and of course I thought of this, right? Like I wasn't, you know, this isn't a surprise, right? right. But I, I think it was important to, um, uh, to, to, to give an insider's perspective. Uh, there's so much misinformation. And frankly, uh, we are teaching people to give up control by calling technology addictive. And again, you know, little asterisk here, it does addict some people. Clearly, you know, alcohol, uh, lots of us enjoy a glass of wine. We're not all alcoholics. Lots of us, uh, you, you know, we enjoy a good meal. We're not all food addicts. People who have sex are not all sex addicts. We gamble, but, you know, we play poker. It doesn't make us problem gamblers. Some people do get addicted to these tools. But I think what's happened lately in the media, because it makes for such a good story, ironically, that cranks up even more clicks and makes 
you know, the, the news media even more money, they operate in the same exact business model uh, of selling your attention as, as Facebook does. But I think the narrative has been that this is addicting everyone. And, and that's not helpful and it's not true. And so that was a, a, a big reason that I, I thought it was important to publish this because you know, I started from struggling with this stuff, originally blamed the technology just like everyone else, and then realized that actually the, the story is much more nuanced uh, than, than I think people uh, perpetuate. Excellent. And I'm very excited to read this book. I definitely want to dig into the nuances being such as a student of this subject matter. I love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what is the, yeah, if people are looking to connect with you and to get more information about your books, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so my blog is nearandfar.com, spelled like my first name, N-I-R, so nearandfar.com. And the book is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And if you go to indistractable.com, there are all kinds of resources and tools there that you can get for free. There's an 80-page workbook that I couldn't include in the book. I didn't have enough room for it, but you can download it for free there all at indistractable.com. It's I-N, the word distract, A-B-L-E, indistractable.com. Excellent. I'll be promoting that on my social media as well and definitely getting a copy for myself, especially that workbook, really into that kind of thing. That's perfect. All thank right. you so much. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't wait to hear what you think of it. Yeah, and thank you again so much for taking the time to be with us today on your daily writing habit on behalf of my listeners and myself, and thank you all for joining me here on Your Daily Writing Habit, where I am helping you write and finish writing an awesome book. Until tomorrow, happy writing.